think on these things. I venture to say that the majority of our men and women elected to serve in this honorable House of Assembly are persons of prayer and faith in God. As you know, prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Words are so easily spoken, but prayer without faith both the Lord. How faith when you speak to the Master? That's all he asked you for. Prayer is the key to heaven, but faith unlocks the door. Hebrews 11 says, now faith is the substance, the confirmation, title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. For by faith, trust, and holy, holy, holy forever, born of faith, the men of old had the wine testimony born to them and obtained a good report. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for waking us up this morning. It's on our way rejoicing in the God of our salvation. Lead, guide, and our honorable members in their discussions and to our national body, 28, 2019. You are the God of miracles. You are the God of wonders. Thank you for being the God of the Commonwealth of Bahamas. Because we are the faith. Miracles and wonders are coming our way. Amen. On members, visitors in the gallery, you who are tuned to this broadcast, pray. Our Father. Everybody. In your name, thy kingdom come. This is heaven. Give us this day daily bread. We forget those. It is not a temptation. There shall be one. And it's the kingdom. Our glory. Amen. Amen. Good morning, good morning, honorable members. Uh, we wish to welcome our special guests in the gallery. What is interesting is that arrangements were made for this visit uh, weeks ago. And at the time, the arrangements were made the schedule of speakers were not yet determined. But God is good. Because on this day, the group joining us will have the opportunity to hear directly from the member for South Beach, who is the Minister of Education. Uh, joining us this morning, uh, representatives from a number of schools out of Great Abaco. They are principally primary schools, and they are led by the teachers Yolanda Curry, Beatrice Moxie, and Paul Knowles. The primary in schools from Abaco include J.A. Pinder Primary, Crossing Rocks Primary, 
Amy Roberts Primary, Central Avoco Primary, Treasure Key Primary, Cooperstown Primary, Foxtown Primary, Hope Town Primary, Manawaki Primary, and the primary school from Cherokee Sound. Also joining us this morning uh, is a contingent uh, from Elutra. And they are led by teachers, uh, Miss Nicolette Anderson, Christine Thompson, Chanel Mitchell, and the principal, uh, Natalie Sweeting, uh, who is also joined by Miss Johnette Lockhart. Those schools include Deep Creek, Wimses Bight, Green Castle, Rock Sound, Tampa Bay, Tapham Bay, James Sistant, Governor's Harbor, and Samuel Gray. Samuel Guy, okay. And I believe the last school, or two schools, are Laura Anderson and Harbor Island All Age School. Uh, and first of all, I would like to um, extend to the member for North Abaco the opportunity to uh, bring greetings on behalf of the schools from Abaco and to make apologies for the member for Central and South Abaco who uh, has reported to me is not experiencing the best of health at this time. The chair recognizes the honorable member for North Abaco. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, for the courtesy is extended on this occasion. And we have all of these students here from, from Abaco. I would also, at your behest, extend apologies to those from the Keys in South and Central for the absence of the Honorable James Albury, who couldn't be here with us today, of course, because he's not, he's not feeling well. But I feel special. I feel special because I am a graduate of Dundas Town Primary School, which was amalgamated into the Central Primary School where the, 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 the principal is Beatrice Moxie, a wonderful woman of God who, who is also my sister, <laughs> my adopted sister, adopted by my parents when she came to Abaco to, to teach and remains a firm part of my family. I'm also special because the principal in Foxtown Primary, Ms. Yolanda Curry, is my god sister. And so, and so you know, these kids are in, in, in very good hands because they are in the hands of, of, of women of God who will train and teach them in the right way. I crave your indulgence, Mr. Speaker, just to say one or two words. I was privileged to speak at the high school graduation in Treasure Key for Patrick Bethel High and for Sherlyn Boodle High on Monday. And I thought I should share with the, ch the children who, who, who graduated some things about, you, you know, intellectual discourse and the rest of that is okay. But I think we need to give our kids in this day and time some, some things to live by, some, some, some truisms that I think have managed to serve us well. Uh, Abaco is, a, is an illustrious place. We've produced from North Abaco a prime minister who sat in this place, uh, one that, that I follow. Uh, he, sat, he sat in this place three times as, as Prime Minister, and for almost, I think, now 40 years as a member of parliament for North Abaco. He's an Abaco boy, and, and I, I mean no, no disparagement when I, say, when I say that. And I now sit in this place as a Minister of Foreign Affairs who, who is an Abaco boy from Dundas Town. Uh, the former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Hubert Alexander Ingram, grew up in Cooperstown. And so, I believe if you, if you follow these couple of words briefly, uh, albeit briefly, of advice, Mr. Speaker, that you, you will fare well in your future, and you will know that there's no barrier that can hold you down, and you can be and do anything that you aspire to in life if you put your mind to it. The first one is this. 
You know, I, I see my colleague in the cabinet, uh, the Honorable Renwood Wells, and he said to me that my sister, Ms. Ms. Moxie, was his primary school teacher. That's right. And that's, that's, I, I found that interesting as well. And, and him too? Oh, the Honorable, the Honorable Member for, for, for West, West Grand Bahama and Bimini? She was also your student? Here, here, here's what I want to say to you students very briefly, and I'll take my seat because I know you want to hear from my good friend, the Minister of Education. I'd also like to recognize Mrs. Lloyd, the Honorable Mrs. Lloyd, who, who sits also in the gallery. Yeah. She's my friend, too. The first thing we, 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 we should do, students, is put God first. The Bible says that if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, everything else will be added unto you. Consult him with everything you do. Pray about everything before you stand up. Pray before you open your mouth. Pray before you make any decisions. I ain't going to preach. I can sit down in a second. <laughs> right? My grandmother probably never had a primary school education like you. But there's something she, she said to me always that, that I take with me wherever I go. She said, son, you don't have to be the smartest man in the world, but manners and respect will take you throughout the world. You know, you could be as smart as Albert Einstein. But if you are ill-mannered, if you are disrespectful, if you are impolite, nobody wants you around them. And so you take manners and respect wherever you go. There's, there's nothing wrong with saying yes sir, no sir, yes ma'am, no ma'am. There's nothing wrong with that. I sit in the cabinet with the prime minister as an equal. But he's the chief among us. And I answer him, sir, maybe it's my military training, maybe it's my upbringing. I hope it's both. There's nothing wrong with that. Take manners and respect with you wherever you go. The third thing I want to say to you is hard work pays off. There was a, there was a famous inventor. Uh, his name alludes me now. He, he, he invented the light bulb, they say. What's his name? Edison. Thomas, Edison. Thomas Edison. In trying to, to create some of his inventions, this is what he said. He said that I never failed in any attempt that I made to create an invention. He said, in one of them, I found 10,000 ways that it does not work. In life, you're going to find some hardships. You, you're going to, to fall along the way. But get yourself up and continue to work hard. Work hard. There's no, there's no substitute for hard work. Hard work will cause you to, to experience and realize the full potential that God has given to you. And with those, with those few things, uh, I, I don't want to be too long. I want to congratulate your, your teachers for, for bringing you here. When I was in primary school, I never had this opportunity. And so I want you to drink in all that you can whilst you're here in New Providence and go and see Government House. I'm sure you're going to do that. You're in Parliament today. Uh, you will hear from your Minister of Education. I want to congratulate you all students because I think you represent excellence in the island of Abaco. And excellence is always good, always strive to be better than mediocre. That will set you apart from the others. And I, and I say to you, God bless you and God keep you. Cause his face to shine upon you and always give you peace. I thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, thank, thank you Honorable Member. The Honorable Member spoke for North Abaco, Central and South Abaco. And so I want the, the members from Eleuthera to take that into consideration when I extend <laughs> this opportunity to each of you. Uh, I, the chair now recognizes the honorable member from North Elutra. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's indeed a privilege to have the opportunity to welcome the primary students from North and Central South Elutra. Just this week, I had the privilege of having a discussion with some teachers about what appears to be going wrong in our schools. But the one thing they kept emphasizing was that the primary school and their teachers is the foundation to which education is built. It appears is that at the primary level, everything seems to go well, but when they pass over into the high school level, they seem to have challenges. But my message to the students, mainly the students, because the teachers, they already 
have their careers, they've, they've made their mark in life, and some of them have formed the lives of so many individuals, including some who sit in this house, which has just been explained. You're set, but to the young ones, the primary students, we want you to absorb everything that you can while you're in school. I know it's a bit early to process what all education really means to you. Don't let it just be a playful time, a time to associate with your friends. Let it be a time when you take in what your teachers are imparting to you so that when you, as you grow up, as you mature, you will find the tools that they have equipped you with would be able to take you throughout life and that you could be very successful. My colleague and I had the privilege of attending the graduation exercise for the seniors on Monday. We were also blessed and graced with the presence of the Minister of Education. Um, the ceremony was held in James Siston and it was so rewarding to see so many students excelling as a result of the 12 years that they spend in school. My wish is for those of you who hail from Eleuthera that we have the opportunity to also attend your graduation when you will have, when you will have done all of your studies and be able to pass on and become model citizens in our society. Uh, my granddaughter, who's having our graduation ceremony tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Um, I'm not going to be there because I'll be here, but tomorrow evening we're going to have a little get together because I want to show her my appreciation for what she's trying to accomplish. And to the teachers, I say thank you. You have played such a vital role in the building of this nation. I think every person who has succeeded in life have that special teacher to think back on and the role that they played in their life, informing them and directing them and instilling in them the virtues that they needed to be successful. And I say especially thanks to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The, ch the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Central and South Lutra. Good morning. Mr. Speaker, I would like for the students from Central and Saudi Luther to stand so everyone can see who is from Central and Saudi Luther, if you will. And also the staff members. Mr. Speaker, I do not intend to be so biased this morning, but I can honestly stand in this honorable house this morning and say hats off to the students in South and Central Eleuthera this year, because this year has been a remarkable year for South and Central Eleuthera when we look back at what has taken place in South and Central Eleuthera. Our schools have achieved many goals, many goals in the line of education and sports in the South and the Central area. And for that, I'm, I'm grateful, and I, say, I want to say a special thank you to you, the students, and to you, the faculty, who made this happen. It happened because of you. And that is why we have young Jonathan, who represented Central Eleuthera and the Bahamas in Washington just last week, competing over 9,000 different spelling bee competition members, and to be narrowed down to number 49 in the world. That's a great accomplishment in the island of Eleuthera. To you students, my words to you are simple. You have begun a course in life. You have an opportunity to achieve the goals in which you have set out to achieve. You are not too young to soar into the heavens. I would encourage you this morning to continue to pursue the dreams, to make sure that you bring the rewards that you set out to achieve. Your lives may be young, but I'm certain you're doing remarkably well. And the reason why you're here is because you have been chosen to be here. 
and you're doing a, a remarkable job. I want to thank you. I want to congratulate you. I want to continue to encourage you to continue to pursue the goal of your dreams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, honorable members. Someone said that if a man's education is finished, he is finished. And so my word to the students from Abaco and from Eleuther and indeed throughout this archipelago is that you should never ever let it be said that you are finished. Your entire life should be an educational process. And you are indeed uh, have an excellent opportunity this morning as we proceed uh, in that you would hear directly from your Minister of Education. As many, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for South Beach. Mr. Speaker, it is with great honor and privilege and respect to the magnificent I am consciousness and presence that I give rise this morning to address this Honorable House and the Bohemian people as a member of South Beach in whose confidence and whose generosity that I stand and I'm privileged to serve in this place. And also a little bit later on, Mr. Speaker, to give an accounting to this House and to the nation of the stewardship of the Ministry of Education. I wish to join our colleagues, Mr. Minister, uh, Mr. Speaker, and yourself, sir, in extending uh, gracious wishes and highest and best regards to our young students from Eleuthera and Abaco. I have not had the honor of visiting South, Abaco, uh, South Eleuthera quite yet, Mr. Jay. I will get there, but I was in James Sisten on Monday for the graduation of the uh, approximately 70 plus students from around the Eleuthera district. Great honor, Mr. Speaker, wonderful opportunity. <clears throat> this year, like last year, this year we have not individual school graduations, we have them by districts. That's a um, process that we are working through because it is meeting with some consternation and some resistance by some in the communities, <clears throat> which we understand. We hope that, however, they will see the wisdom of our efforts in this respect and um, make it possible for us to facilitate um, the best use of our resources so that uh, in a most copious and economical way we would be able to engage this annual rite of passage known as graduation. So congratulations, my dear beloved teachers, facilitators, co-producers of education, and uh, best wishes to you students for this opportunity you have, blessed opportunity you have in, uh, in your lives. Mr. Speaker, just quickly, I had the honor of visiting with Central Abaco Primary, and one of my um, uh, Camp Road Associates, Ms. Moxing. I was fascinated, Mr. Speaker, that I entered into the preschool classroom where the three-year-olds were all using tablets. Three-year-olds, all using tablets. <laughs> this is the genius of Ms. Moxie. And what, is, what was fascinating about that, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, was that they were all able to read through the use of the tablets. Three years old. We are off to a fantastic start, but we are going to speak a little bit more about that later on in our presentation, Mr. Speaker. So congratulations and best wishes. This morning, Mr. Speaker, I also rise a little bit with a heavy heart. Extending on behalf of the Ministry of Education, our condolences to one of our team members, Mr. Errol Williams, who was shot yesterday morning while guarding the A.F. Adley School. According to the reports that I received last night, he was sitting doing his duty, and he was, and another a security agent, 
accosted by two armed marauders, miscreants, vagabonds, yes. who struck him over the head with the gun, <coughs> shot him, and then ran on him. If there's anything more senseless than that, Mr. Speaker, I don't know. Not robbed, just simply a victim of senseless violence. Mm -hmm. So our community is deeply saddened by this. It has been shaken. Of course, as you know, Mr. Speaker, these young people who serve our community as security agents are at times placed in vulnerable circumstances which we seek to address, and we will do so very urgently. Um, they are performing, in many instances, tasks which are unenviable, <coughs> but are required. And as we advance in technology, the need for their exposure, we expect, will be substantially reduced. I wish also, before I forget, Mr. Speaker, to extend to all fathers in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, especially those in this honorable chamber, a happy Father's Day this coming, this coming Sunday. <clears throat> it is no accident that I see that there is a plethora of crab spaces that are now exposed <laughs> across our islands. <clears throat> I don't particularly like crabs, but if that is the feature of, of um, that's the feature of, uh, of our society, then so be it. Uh, they don't treat mothers that way, but God be praised. Um, we are grateful nevertheless. I think that there is a shifting in the cultural expressions of the uh, honoring of fathers now that they will do something a little bit more than just a basket of, let me continue on. Mr. Speaker, <clears throat> South Beach has been a privilege of mine to serve these, this past year. It is a place where the community has taken to me as I to it, and I wish to give it my highest and best honor and regard. We are serious about our representation. We are serious about the mandate by our leader, the Honorable Member for Kalani, in that we have and have had our uh, quarterly town meetings bringing to four and giving opportunity for discussion and ventilation, the issues which confront their lives. Every Thursday, for as long as is necessary, if I'm in town, I am in that constituency, in my office, assisting with those who wish to meet with their representative. Every month, every month, Mr. Speaker, the last Tuesday of the month, as it will be next week, Tuesday, we have a constituency meeting where, again, an overflow crowd comes to hear what's going on in their constituency. I'm very I'm proud of the members of our team, grateful for their work, grateful that we have today now an after-school program focused on literacy, reading, potential, capability. We have had our massive cleanup in the community, which we will continue. We are going to put speed bumps. We have had our street um, signage exercise in the community. Um, <clears throat> moving out derelict vehicles is a process underway in which we have had, sir, and of course the engagement overall of our community. So I'm grateful, Mr. Speaker, for them, and I am proud of their work so far in our community. As I said, sir, I give thanks to Almighty for this inaugural year of transformation in the Ministry of Education and for the accomplishments that we have made and the foundation which we are laying for the benefit of the Bahamian people, sir. Last year, I had the privilege of meeting with a young, dynamic Bahamian entertainer, and I threw out a challenge to him during that encounter to conceive for me and the ministry a song that would inspire every adult and every child in our community to do the best job that they can. Those 75,000 students in the public and private sector who sit under the remit for which I am responsible, sir. This young man created a sound, Mr. Speaker, a song called, I Believe in You. 
Some of you may have heard it. And it aims to tell our children, and it's to say to you, my dear beloved young people, that we, the adults of our community, have faith in your ability. And we want you to have faith in that ability as well. Because too often, if you are certainly like me at your age, growing up in Camp Road here in New Providence, you would have heard too often, too many times, too uh, repeated negative messages about what you cannot do and why you cannot do it because of who you are and where you are. I didn't want the honorable member for North Abaco to stop. He was on his wicket and he was doing well. But if I may just add a little to that sermon he gave this morning, I share this with you, my dear young people, and as I have shared with all of our young people, it's not where you come from. It's what you come to. That is important. I thought, Mr. Speaker, that because one of the thrusts of our ministry is the issue of technology, that I would share with this honorable house the feature, a signature element of that technological thrust here today. Eventually, Mr. Speaker, each member of this house and members of the press are going to receive this book. This book, this is the book, Slaking, I believe. It's quite unique, quite innovative. Because, Mr. Speaker, when you open the book, it just begins. It begins with the agenda of the Ministry of Education for this next year. And the other I was tempted to give it earlier, Mr. Speaker, but I know if I did, sir, then they wouldn't pay attention to me. <laughs> so, not going to do it. You will get it at the lunch break. Mr. Speaker, for many humans, we are like Paul Cello the, in The Alchemist looking for treasure everywhere, but actually where it lies, that is within ourselves. The alchemist found that the treasure that he went to ends of search was right where we started, in his dreams, in his aspirations, and ultimately in his belief that he could do whatever he set out to do. The honorable member for North Abaco just said a moment ago. To apply this concept to our reality, Mr. Speaker, we must begin to seek in earnest the treasure that resides, the genius that resides within our young people. We are called by our vocation to cultivate their talents, abilities, and their gifts, to enable them to develop a stronger and progressive nation. And that is why when we send them away to school, we seek to assure them a place in our society. Mr. Speaker, my heart was gladdened yesterday when I heard the Honorable Member for South and Central Andros presciently repeat a wise aphorism, words matter. He had spoken well beyond his understanding. <laughs> for I recall the remonstrations, Mr. Speaker, of my erstwhile senior, the Honorable Member for Cat Island, whom I wished was here this morning, in his castigation of the Honorable Member for Kalani, you would remember this, for his remarks about corruption in the Bahamas during his visit, the Member of Kalani's visit <clears throat> this year to the Summit of Americas in Peru. The Honorable Member for North Abaco, myself, the Attorney General, accompanied the Prime Minister on that visit. Honorable member for Cat Island only knows too well, as well as the South and Central Andrus member, who now is a law student, of the Latin maxim. And I quote, Qui autumo portet equo et puras vio. Yes. <laughs> and it says this, he who comes to equity must come with clean if that doesn't ring true enough, Mr. Speaker, 
May I refer him or them to Jesus' admonition in Matthew 7 and 3. And it says the following. Why do you seek the speck that is in your brother's eye? But do not notice the log that is in your own. End quote. Because it cannot fall from the lips of the side opposite about talking down this country, Mr. Speaker. Oh, no. I have listened to and have been a student of the news and current affairs for 60 plus years in this country. I have listened to her nearly every newscast, every national event when I am able. And I can remember in October of 1972 on the floor of the PLP's convention, and the former cabinet minister, the Honorable Loftus Roker, claimed that corruption was rocking the PLP to its very foundation. Yep. It was carried live over 1540 ZNS at the time. <laughs> talking more about corruption, talking about talking down this country, talking more about corruption. Yes. I remember in October, September rather, October of two, 1984, when the Miami Herald carried an insert entitled A Nation for Sale. Well, let's come into the modern era. Mr. Speaker, how many of us would not remember in 2012 when signs were plastered across this capital announcing 490 murders, scaring our tourists and some of our residents alike? Reporters asked the honorable leader of the opposition if he was not concerned about placing these signs. And he repeated these words. Are we about suppressing the truth? Are we about hiding the truth? End quote. Words matter, Mr. Speaker. Words matter. You know, Jesus reminded us in Mark 1 and 15. I quote, the time has come. The kingdom of God is near, but it gives us a requirement. Repent and believe the good news. Amen. Amen. Cannot come looking to the kingdom without first doing your repentance. Amen. Amen. This is why, Mr. Speaker, I noted the Guardian's editorial of last week, which read in part, and then you know, the Guardian is no friend of this government. You know that. However, the Guardian's, especially the Honorable Member for Kalani, but the Guardian wrote an editorial in which it said the following, and I quote, Politics aside, this is re, uh, repeating the honorable, and I adopt these, by the way, Mr. Speaker, repeating the honorable member for Exuma, the honorable Chester Cooper. His, here's what the editorial says, quoting him. Politics aside, a bad idea is a bad idea, and this is a tremendously bad idea, the honorable member said. Quote, and no amount of spin and talking points and press briefings about who is to blame can mask the lazy predatory nature of this tax increase, nor make it easy to swallow for the public that will pay for your bad decisions. Continuing the quote, the editorial writes, the Bahamian people will not easily forget how this administration put their future in jeopardy. Then the editorial continues. This is the same Chester Cooper who ran in the 2017 general election trying to make Perry Christie prime minister again. The same Perry Christie who led the Bahamas through five years of recession and stagnation. The same Perry Christie who led the borrowing of billions of dollars and had little to show in accomplishments. So Chester Cooper wanted us to vote for five more years of Christie. And we are now supposed to stand with him against this government. The editorial continued. Cooper's solution to the mess last time was more Christie. And now we are supposed to trust his judgment. You see how warped the PLP logic is? The editorial continued, Mr. Speaker. We say to Bahamians, think carefully as you listen to the PLP. Think carefully as you listen to people who are leading you to the PLP. The PLP was taking us on a path to ruin. You voted them out to save your country. The PLP, listen carefully, has still not given a full-throated apology for all it did last time. It is counting on you forgetting 
and returning it to carry on. Oh. End quote. That's the guardian, Mr. Speaker, who is no friend of the free national movement. Mr. Speaker, wow. let it be unvarnished and unequivocal. I support this budget. Uncomfortable in some of its terms it may appear to be, I am happy and proud, distinguishingly so, with the guts shown by this government to confront with conscientious vigor the fiscal and economic travails that beset this land, travails that have been decades in the making. Let me give you an example, Mr. Speaker. I can remember the interview back in 1970-something, 74 or 75. The interview was given by the Honorable Arthur Dion Hanna, father of the Honorable Member for Engliston, who at the time was the Deputy Prime Minister and the Minister of Finance. At that time, Mr. Hanna said that the Bahamas was borrowing to pay salaries. 1975. Wow. And he continued, and this was on ZNS 1540, that it could not be sustained. Mr. Speaker, 45 or so years later, we are still borrowing to pay salaries. Oh. Yeah, continue. Yeah. Because we are so vulnerable, so susceptible to external shocks, or to a severe global economic downturn. Yes. We, sir, cannot continue the reckless way of living that we have had yes. for these past four and a half decades. No I have repeatedly said over the airwaves that at some point, the chickens will come home. We have been warned that we were heading, in fact, on one of my radio shows, a member of the side opposite in the previous administration, on one of my shows, I asked him, do you think the country is heading towards a failed state? This was back in 2006. The gentleman said, it's not heading. It is galloping towards a failed state on my radio show, Mr. Speaker. Take note. We have listened to the responses. We have listened to the commentary. Nowhere have I heard from the side opposite or the armchair pundits elsewhere any credible refutation, any legitimate disproof of the precarious state, financial state that this country is in. Nowhere. Not one contrary viewpoint about the legacy debts of $360 million. Not a single disputing word about our growing debt to GDP ratio. Not a single contrast to the position taken by this government. Long, I have long, anyone who knows me, long insisted that we as a people must act with discipline and order. That was my upbringing. And I have lived by the aphorism, Mr. Speaker, that you cannot hang your hat any higher than you can reach it. The unpalatable, unpardonable, unvarnished truth is simply this, sir. We have maxed out our credit card. We have not a single cent to spare. And the country is sitting at a precarious state of disaster from which, if not some serious and gutsy decision is not made today, Mr. Speaker, we are over that precipice from which there is no return. And as the DPM said yesterday, or as reported in The Guardian to have said, or the newspaper, we are one disaster away from disaster. I have lunch vendors in this country, Mr. Speaker, lunch vendors who provide lunch for our beautiful young people. Haven't been paid for months. Months. Who are these lunch vendors? They are our grandmothers and godmothers and mothers and aunts. Some of them 
have been brought near to the point of financial ruin because they have had to go on month after month after month without having been paid. Mr. Speaker, I have, I have for people um, um, contractors from last year, June and July, who worked last year, did school repairs. We managed to pay them in May of this year. There is simply no money in the bank. I say one last word. Let me say one last word. I think it's important for the uh, I think it's important for the side opposite to hear this. I say one last word. You cannot threaten me about no next election. Let me just make sure you understand that. Yeah. Yeah. Can't threaten me. And I don't think you can threaten this side. We didn't come here to worry about no election. We came here to rescue the country. Elections will take care of themselves. Mr. Speaker. Us and our children and our grandchildren have to live here. We have nowhere to go. I would rather lose an election any day yes. than to lose my Bahamas and beautiful Bahamas. Shouts! So waste your time not threaten me about no election. Right. I am here to rescue the Commonwealth of the Bahamas as I have been doing all my life. Responsible oh, Mr. Speaker, I stand here in my second major presentation to this Honorable House as Minister of Education. We have seen some successes in education. In the 2017-18 school year, particularly where our students are concerned, they, they heard what I said. All right. Say it again. You ain't gonna hear nothing more from them for the rest of the five years. <laughs> Before speaking about our plans, Mr. Speaker, for the next budget year and beyond, I would like see, Mr. Speaker, let's be clear. Let's be clear. Preach it, okay? Preach it. We got this side, we ain't tied to politics. No. We are servants. Yeah. Right. Of the people. We came to serve and to lend for the benefit of our people, our gifts, talents, and abilities. At any time, the sovereign power of this country, which happens to be people, yeah. Yeah. can decide whether they wish that service or not. Right. That is their one indisputable right. right. Yes. Yes. And they will exercise it. But one thing they are going to remember about this government, we saved this country. Yes. May I respectfully, Mr. Speaker, share some outstanding achievements by our members. Last year, I was proud to present to Ms. Paloma Cartwright of NGM the All Bahamas Merit Scholarship. Powerful young lady. I think she had about 10 BGCSEs, all A's, and one with a B. Wow. Then we have from Central Elutra High School, Elutra, Jonathan Randall. Jonathan went to the national, uh, I think it's the Scripps, eh? the Scripps National Spelling Bee in Washington, Mr. Speaker. There were 519, 519 contestants. He came number 42. Wow. Number 42. There was a young Remington Minnis of Eva Hilton Primary. For the first time, Eva Hilton had a winner in the Primary Student of the Year contest. Remington Win Minnis won that. All female team from Anatole Rogers High School won the 2018 Build a Bridge competition. We are very proud of them. Earlier this year, just recently, as a matter of fact, in alignment with the Office of the Prime Minister and the Inter American Development Bank, there was a, a collaboration between public and private schools that showcased the best of Bahamian education called the Sustainable Nassau Action Plan Ideathon. Here's what happened, Mr. Speaker. 41 students from 10 to 12 grades, 10 high schools, and the University of the Bahamas worked in mixed groups to brainstorm topics related to sustainability of the city of Nassau. Each working group was assigned one of the following topics, smart city or human mobility, or water conservation, 
or renewable energy and better use of the marine ecosystem. The winning group, the winning group, the winning group, Mr. Speaker, comprised of Ange Angela Roll of C.I. Gibson, Shara Jervis of C.C. Sweeting, and Lyric Lybrun of C.V. Bethel, the winning group. Second place comprised of Luke Brown Browing of St. Andrews, Kiran Halkidis of St. Augustine's, and Talia Swain of C.I. Gibson. That's the second group. And then the third group was Gabriel Moultrie, Moultrie, Gabriel Moultrie of St. Andrews, yeah. Jada Ritchie of Queens College, and Sarah Albury of Windsor Preparatory, and Chris Mortimer. Here's the benefit, Mr. Speaker. The IDB is going to pay for all of them to go to the MIT labs in Cambridge. Yeah. All of them. What is even better, Mr. Speaker, they will present their ideas to the uh, MIT researchers and they are going to assist them in developing those ideas into applications for the island of New Providence and the city of Nassau. Wow. Isn't that powerful? Yes. powerful. Yes. One more thing, Mr. Speaker. The first time ever from the Caribbean region, the first time our students will be representing the Bahamas. Yes. As you know, Mr. Speaker, education is a fundamental vehicle for the transformation of our Bahamian society. This past December, we, you know, looking for the right word, we brought into being a new executive team at the Ministry of Education, <laughs> brought into being. One of the things that we had to tackle immediately, Mr. Speaker, was the state and the status of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of contract workers. You would have heard me speak about this last year. Their contracts were up in June. I got whipping for this, but I will not deter from this. I believe this with all my heart, soul, and mind. At the end of June, hundreds would have been sent home. But the member for South and Central Andrew says, have a heart, Deacon Lloyd, have a heart. OK, no problem. We invited all of the hundreds, Mr. Speaker, to come to a training so that we could determine how best they may fit themselves into the Ministry of Education. We conducted a training for them, Mr. Speaker. We were very successful in having 403 of them matriculate through that program, 403. Very saddened, Mr. Speaker, that over 200 decided that they didn't need to show up or didn't want to show up. These are contract workers whose contract ended on June of last year. We're giving them a second chance. We went even further, Mr. Speaker, a third chance. We called them in and says, why haven't you shown up? They gave us all kinds of flimsy excuses if they even came to the appointment. I said in the media that, listen, you have a job, come and do it. I think that's elementary, that's basic, that's foundational, come and do your job. If not, you won't have a job. I mean, that's very, I was called every name in the book. How could he, a deacon, be so heartless? Let me tell you something. Jesus took a cord of whip into the temple. Uh -huh. Listen, I grew up in Camp Road. <laughs> I grew up in Camp Yes, <laughs> yes, what the maxim is, huh? Yeah. You can't hear? <laughs> Let's move on. Yeah. I also wish to advise, Mr. Speaker, that over 430 files have been forwarded to the public service for reassessment, salary arrears, and promotions, going back, in some instances, decades. I mean, decades. You have people who have, some instances, retired without having been properly reclassified, creating all kinds of headaches and challenges and problems. I'm also happy to tell you, last year we hired over 100 teachers, 108 to be exact. Let me tell you how proud I am, Mr. Speaker, that we put in the hands of preschoolers over 350 tablets this year. 350 tablets in the hands of our preschoolers and their teachers were properly trained in order to deal with that, with their contents loaded on those tablets. I just spoke about this with Ms. Moxie and how her students are three years old 
recognizing words and even reading them, the use of tablets, Mr. Wow. Speaker. We did that last year. Additionally, sir, BTC donated tablets to the Anatole Rogers School as a part of the digital literacy program. <coughs> and I'm glad to tell you that we are on our way to a major announcement I will make in just a few moments, sir. Please stand by. In terms of the physical plan, Mr. Speaker, there are approximately 15 ongoing projects at this time seeking to refurbish our physical structure. Works at uh, San Salvador Primary, AF Adderley Junior High, C.H. Reeves Junior High, Thelma Gibson Prim uh, Preschool, the Classroom Brock. We also have play big plans for North Elutra. He knows about it, Mr. Speaker. There's works now that are underway at Eva Hilton, Holmes Rock in Grand Bahama, and many others. On July 1st this year, we are going to commence a uh, $7 million school repair program across the Commonwealth of the Bahamas, Mr. Speaker. This past year, we also finished a $4 million upgrade at the Stephen Dillett Primary School. And there's no question, sir, that there's much work to be done with the infrastructure of our Ministry of Education, partly because over the years they have not been properly maintained, and in part because they are simply old. Oh, long past their useful years. Schools like L.W. Young, L.N. Coakley, R.M. Bailey, S.C. McPherson, Government High, Mr. Speaker, all you're doing is holding them up by sticks. They need to be replaced. And that kind of um, effort and energy we are going to take on with us in just a very short while. I am always happy, Mr. Speaker, to report that the Organization of American States have come to our aid. They have provided us with 40 scholarships for Bahamian students, 40. Wow. They have signed a memorandum of understanding between us and the Bahamas, and so that we would have those students going off to various schools in the United States. Further, Mr. Speaker, we also have... Honorable Member. I know we could sing together, Mr. Speaker. Honorable members, uh, no shouting across the floor at this time. I'm also happy to report, Mr. Speaker, that um, this year, because we are looking to reform the pre-primary curriculum, the OAS has given us a grant of $86,000, which we are very proud of and very happy. They are also facilitating through the Inter-American Teacher Network that they are, we are in, um, I think it's next week, Certainly by July, we are going to be training 40 teachers uh, as, a, as a gift from the Organization of American States. I just want to speak briefly about scholarships, Mr. Speaker. The Scholarship and Education Loan Division has been making tremendous strides in increasing opportunities specifically for public school and family island students through the Public Scholars Program and through the efforts visited throughout the Bahamas. In 2017-18, 1,056 scholarships were granted, inclusive of the National Scholarship Program, the National Award and Bursary, and the Public Schools pro uh, Program. It has been completely revamped, 100% online, fully automated, minimizing human error, and applicants now need no longer to fill out paper applications. Because of our um, engagement, vigorous and rigorous engagement, Mr. Speaker, we can now boast of relationships with 49 colleges and universities throughout the United States and Canada. What this means is that these universities have entered into a memorandum of understanding, enabling our students to have a 50% rebate on their tuition at these 49 schools. Last year, 118 public scholars benefited. This year, we are looking to close to 150. Uh, Honorable Fort Charlotte, we are also have opened an in-house resource center so that parents can go with their students to help in the application process. One of the challenging uh, uh, spaces in the Ministry of Education, Mr. Speaker, is the Education Loan Authority. We are trying to revive that loan program. We had hoped that it would be started this year, but that doesn't seem possible. And the reason is simple. 
thousands of Bahamians owe approximately $100 million to the authority. Wow. $100 million. 2016, the government gave an incentive that was to run for 12 months. It was designed to address the delinquencies and rewards to those borrowers who were paying or genuinely wanted to honor their obligations. This was a grace period during which no interest would be applied to the loans. During this 12-month period, borrowers who wished to pay off their loans in full would settle their loans by repaying the principal only and all interest and related charges would be forgiven. To date, 498 over the sum of the some 5,000 have paid off their loans through the incentive program. However, sad to say, Mr. Speaker, the authority has had to initiate action against stubbornly delinquent borrowers who have refused every effort at an amicable solution. As a result, there are hundreds of students that graduate every year, many who do not have the financial means to continue their tertiary educational pursuits, many of whom are turned away because we simply do not have the money in the scholarship, scholarship, not the loan, scholarship division. We have 5,000 applicants every year, Mr. Speaker, for scholarships, and we only are able to give out 561 scholarships. That means 4,500 students will be turned away. And the qualifying standard for a, uh, for a scholarship is a three-point average. That is 4,500 4, of our best and brightest who may miss an opportunity to get some financial assistance. And yet, we have thousands, hundreds, thousands rather, of those who have borrowed money who have refused to pay it back. We are going after them with dispatch and aggression. Mr. Speaker. I am also happy to report to this honorable house today that we have a what is called the Future Teachers of the Bahamas program. There are presently 206 cadets in that program. In order to make it attractive, we have to pay them a stipend, Mr. Speaker, and they stay. I'm very glad to tell you, sir, that many do stay and eventually end up coming into the Ministry of Education as teachers. Very proud of that. We want to expand that, to continue to work feverishly, to invite among the best and the brightest. But you know what are some of the impediments, especially young men who might design to be a teacher. They look at the salary scales, sir, and suggest that they could do better elsewhere. That, sir, must be corrected. There is a feature in our Ministry of Education called NACOB the National Accreditation and Equivalency Council. This is one that has also received some pushback from the institutions in our country. Let me just say this, Mr. Speaker, and I wish to make a special mention of those institutions that may be causing some challenge with regard to this. I re refer you to the Education Act, and it says the following. No independent school other than an exempt school, which is not in existence at the date of this act, shall be open, maintained, or conducted unless and until it is registered under the provisions of this act and pending compliance with the provisions of subsection 3 of this section, the minister may grant provisional registration for such periods as he may think fit of any school. Most, of course, institutions do not know this. And they, therefore, resist this registration process. And all I am saying, Mr. Speaker, is registration, not accreditation. We haven't gotten to that stage. Just registration. And they have resisted. So we have had to get tough. Honorable member for East Grand Bahama, Minister, uh, Minister of Finance, we have got to get tough. You don't register, you get nothing from the government. They came running, asking for all kinds of um, grace periods. And we said no. And we insisted upon it. And it is going to become even more dastardly, Mr. Speaker, and here's why. Because we have across this country, and you'll hear more about it in later on in this speech, we have across this country people who open schools, and I hope that parents pay attention to this, people who open schools, especially for the youngest of our ch children, 
and they are woefully unqualified. They do not know what they are doing. In fact, they are a danger to society. It's that. They have so much baggage themselves in their personal lives. And in their anger or spite or jealousy or whatever you want to call it. The children are the victims of it. And we have visited some of these places, Mr. Speaker, and there is unspeakable disgrace. Nastiness. As a matter of fact, I cannot see how a well-intentioned, thinking mother could dare, well, I, I shouldn't say that, because in certain desperate circumstances, you need the help, you need the help. But my God, and it is our responsibility to see that there is something done about that. All right, so listen, we are more than happy to assist them in becoming qualified. If you are interested in working with little children, we are happy to assist you in becoming qualified. But when we assist you or attempt to resist you, don't resist us. Because our obligation is not to you and the monies that you are trying to make, but rather to our babies. And the Ministry of Education is committed to ensuring that educational institutions operating in the Bahamas are fully registered and in time accredited. And we want to do this and need to do this, sir so that they can maintain the necessary benchmarks that are com comparable to international standards. Another warning I wish to issue to our Bahamian people. As of late, there has been a growth of higher education institutions throughout our country. While many have received recognition or accreditation and are operating in accordance with the industry standards, please be aware that some are not. I want to encourage Bahamians who are considering registering in various colleges and universities to utilize the services of NACOP before you enroll to ensure that the institution is offering a program that is relevant, that is credible, and that is recognized, Mr. Speaker. We have found institutions who are offering, within a very short space of time, bachelor, master, and PhD degrees, a process that would ordinarily take over 10 years. They are able to get it within two and a half to three years. Not a chance. In fact, Mr. Speaker, I saw one of the dissertations for the PhD program. Now, Mr. Speaker, for those of us who know about university, as the honorable member for Kalani who had to write a book before he got out of medical school, that was the dissertation, some three, four hundred pages. I saw one dissertation, so that was nine and a half pages. What? Doctoral dissertation, <laughs> nine and a half pages. <laughs> that was the dissertation. <laughs> Might have been profound. <laughs> Profoundly stupid. <laughs> At the doctoral level, sir, you are providing new knowledge. That's why it's called a doctoral. It's the doctor of philosophy. In other words, you come out with a new Bahamas Technical Vocational Institution. It is the intention of this government that BTVI becomes and remains a major play in the development of our country. To this end, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to <clears throat> announce to this Honorable House and to the Bahamian people only to repeat what has been said by the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama, the Minister of Finance. This year, beginning in 2018, September, every qualified full-time student enrolled in BTVI will do so free of charge.
We naturally expect, therefore, a spike in enrollment. As such, the campuses in Grand Bahama and New Providence will be upgraded and outfitted to train thousands of students who will take, an op take advantage of this opportunity to acquire new skills to upgrade themselves. Mr. Speaker, this is what we call the people's time. This is what we call dealing in vain. This is how we empower our people through giving them an education that will last long after the handout is gone. I also want to report, sir, that we are seeking and hopefully will receive approval for a facility through the Caribbean Development Bank to enable BTVI to resume construction and completion of the smart classrooms and the upgrades I just mentioned. And I'm very proud of the board there led by Mr. Kevin Baston and the President, Dr. Robertson, for their leadership and passion in leading this institution. And I'm confident they're going to raise the status of that school. But we have a number of problems, Mr. Speaker, with technical vocational education in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. And it probably, it's a cultural thing, I don't know, but be that as it may, fine. We have taught our children that if you're not academic, then go do something with your hand. That is very bad. Please stop that. Stop it. All schooling is academic. Because you must know how to read, write, understand, analyze. That's academic. It's basic. It's foundational, Mr. Speaker. And we must recognize and respect the fact that there's genius in every vocation irrespective of what it is. Yeah. So this poor image that technical vocation and education has gotten is a perennial problem. And it distracts and disabuses our otherwise interested young people from pursuing opportunities there. You have also a problem with competency and based on qualifications that we are going to correct. Sir. We are seeking public private partnerships enable for us to advance educations, particularly in this field. And we are obviously open, as some of our potential sits in the gallery to my right, Mr. Speaker. I am also not happy to report to you this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, though I am indeed grateful that today in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas we have some 116 technical education teachers. 116. Only 41 are Bahamians of the 116. Only 41 are Bahamian. Of that 41, almost 25, 25 in fact, are about to retire. So here's the challenge. We're going to go ahead with the upgrades at BTVI and go ahead with expanding the opportunities for education there with free tuition and so on and so forth. But we need the teachers, Mr. Speaker. And so we're going to go after this with abandon to seek out and to enable us to get our circumstance in order. Hopefully the IDB is going to assist us as well as the CDB in this regard. University of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, in the fall of 2017, they were just short of 5,000 students, 4,923 to be exact. At the start of 2018, there was a drop in the enrollment. It's now 4,465. Something that I noted this year, I was not the graduation, but I got the report from my colleague, ministerial colleague, the member for, um, what's Cam Road name? Freetown. 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 Pardon me. Um, there were approximately 900, 900 graduates of the University of Bahamas, 900. 650 were females, 250 males. Somebody made note of this this morning about the disproportion. What happens when after primary school there seems to be a fall off? That challenge, Mr. Speaker, we are seeking to arrest by the provisions. And I have heard the Honorable Member for Kalani opine that maybe we must, as a nation, consider some kind of affirmative action for males 
when it comes to education because we are losing them after the grade 7, right after grade 7. We are losing them. They feel that making money is a much more attractive and, and, and there's another reason for that, uh, Fort Charlotte. There's another reason, Mr. Speaker. It's another reason. It's the way they are taught. Boys learn differently from girls. Not better. Girls don't learn any better than boys. Boys don't learn any better than girls. They learn differently. And what countries have found is boys need more frequent breaks so they can go out and play. Now, when I was growing up, play was considered foolish work. But according to the Inter-American Development Bank and the new science, play is a fundamental right of children. Fundamental right. Mr. Speaker, I go around to the primary schools and the preschools, and I ask the teachers, how often do the children go out to play? Once a day, Mr. S uh, Mr. Minister. I said, no, sir. At least twice a day they must be out to play. One time structured, one time free. That's how they learn. In fact, every activity should be couched in play. You can teach foreign language, you can teach art, you can teach language, you can teach music, you can teach literacy through play. They think it's play, but they're learning. Listen, this is how I learned the Bible. Mr. Speaker, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, first and second Samuel, first and second, first and second, Corona. That's how I learned the Bible. Mind you, I think I'm singing. There it is. And you never forget it. And so, this challenge, Mr. Speaker, I was a speaker almost a year ago. Or a year ago, I stood in this honorable house making a major presentation to the Bahamian people for the very first time. It was a carefully considered moment, sir, because it provided me the privilege to share a vision for an area of human and Bahamian life that is key to our survival and altruistic beliefs and benefits. It's called education. Nothing is more critical, vital to the successful negotiations of life. At the time, I said these words, and I quote, it is no secret that the established education system in the Bahamas is unable to meet the needs of a 21st century society, one that is in a constant state of flux and evolution. And it is clear that we still battle against outdated and outmoded educational methods. We say that one size does not fit all, but we often teach that way. We value knowledge more than we value skill and creativity. We are too focused on our so-called D-average without an understanding of what D-average indicates. And generally, as a people, we are not involved enough in the process of education in the lives of our children and the student population. At the time, I also said, Mr. Speaker, it is the goal of this government to transform our country into a knowledge-based society. By that, as defined by the Organization of American States, we mean to treat knowledge as a commodity that can be traded for our country's economic prosperity. Knowledge-based societies rely on the knowledge of their citizens to drive the innovation and entrepreneurship and dynamism of that society's economy. This is the focus of this government as we seek to revamp the Bahamian education system in the next five years and in perpetuity. Like the old adage says, the first step in solving a problem is admitting that you have one, Mr. Speaker. When it comes to education, we have a problem. The deficiencies of our education system in failing to effectively equip our young people to meet the needs of a 21st century economy are well documented. National examinations, specifically the GLAT, BJC, and BGCSE examinations, coupled with graduation rates from the past few years, reveal that at every assessment level and at the point of exiting school, too many of our students are failing to meet basic requirements of knowledge and skill, end quote. I stated that last year. Today, Mr. Speaker, we still face a stark reality that our results of our national examinations are not what they ought to be. With 37% of our third graders, 
and 40% of our sixth graders failing the GLAT exam, failing. <coughs> a mere 20% of our ninth graders achieving relative success at the BJC level with five or more subjects with a D pass and above. And only 23%, one out of every four of the BGCSE candidates achieving a D grade and above in five or more subjects. We must do better and we will, Mr. Speaker. It should be noted, sir, that prior to 2017, the criteria for graduation was a non-standardized practice across the country where each institution, public or private, determined the criteria for graduation. A diploma from one institution meant one thing, and a diploma from another institution meant another. By 2030, ministry hopes to achieve its wildly important goal, which is to increase the graduation rate from 50% where it is today, Mr. Speaker, to 85%. And I dare say so we can achieve this goal before then, in fact, we must. No country can be satisfied that half of its graduating or exiting students, half do not meet the minimum standard for graduation. Half. In 2017, Mr. Speaker, this country gave this government a mandate that I interpreted as no longer business as usual. And that meant education. The one entity that each year snares the lion's share of the country's budget. To that end, we in the Ministry of Education went to work to lay out an ambitious agenda for education to the Bahamian people outlined in our manifesto of 2017. Our words were not pie in the sky or empty promises, but rather realistic, achievable, meaningful goals that takes into consideration the needs of our nation and the desire to empower our citizens, particularly our young people, for living and working in a 21st century global society. Mr. Speaker, there is an inescapable and at times unpalatable reality that confronts us each day, and that is this. The world is changing at sometimes warped speeds. It is therefore the obligation of every state to prepare its citizens and residents for the requirements, the demands, and opportunities that such a world presents. The Organization of American States have stated that today, 65% of the children in the first grade must be educated for job opportunities that do not yet exist, and for which in many respects we do not even have a paradigmatic blueprint for knowing what they may be. What we do know, Mr. Speaker, as far as we can tell now, is that there are certain critical life-enhancing a nation producing skills that would be necessary in whatever fields may emerge. They are foundational skills in literacy, numeracy, science, ICT, financial literacy, cultural and civic literacy. Foundational, Mr. Speaker. There must be competencies in critical thinking, creativity, communication, and collaboration. And there must be character qualities, such as curiosity, initiative, grit, adaptability, leadership, and social and cultural awareness. This year, Mr. Speaker, the ministry's budget is just shy of $299 million, a capital budget of $333 million. We hope to make in the ministry, three quarters of a million dollars, 752,000. So we make money in the ministry, by the way. Although UNESCO and other like agencies recommend that our country's budget for education should be about 20% of the gross domestic product, or of our national budget, rather, we are not there yet, Mr. Speaker. Ours is around 20, 12%, 12. But we are going to get there pretty close. And so I express my gratitude to this government for considering and seeing the vital necessity, the value, the prudence of investing in education. As far back as November 1994, the world-famous Atlantic Magazine published an article that was prescient beyond its years, 
It stated, and I quote, knowledge has become the key resource for a nation's economic strength. And this knowledge can be acquired only through schooling. And it is not tied to any country. It is portable. It can be created everywhere, fast and cheaply. Knowledge as the key resource is fundamentally different from the traditional key resources of the economists, land, labor, and even capital. That knowledge has now become a key resource means that there is a world economy and that, and that the world economy rather than the national economy is in control. End quote. Mr. Speaker, the social reconstruction of the Bahamian society is the most demanding imperative of this or any government in this new era of transparency, knowledge, and accountability. <coughs> It was only yesterday, in relative terms, Mr. Speaker, that this nation observed of itself as a slacked, corrupt, and dishonest society in the 1990 Commission on Crime report. It is therefore an exigent demand that this country get on with the business of transforming itself into a productive, competitive, and prosperous society. We only can do it through discipline and order and hard work. To this end, Mr. Speaker, the Ministry of Education has identified four critical goals that have been shared with the Prime Minister's delivery unit to ensure the transformation through education of our Bahamian society. Number one, at the heart of the success of an education system is the quality of its teachers and teaching. There are 3,900 educational professionals in the public sector, dedicated, committed, many going far beyond the call of duty. The quality of an education system, sir, cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. Studies across the globe establish that the one single defining factor in the success of students is the quality of teachers and teaching. The current science supports that teachers are the main driver of in-school effects on student attainment. It provides evidence that a good and effective teacher counteracts all other negative effects, such as a disadvantaged background. Teachers, therefore, sir, are the essential link in the learning process the essential link. Therefore, the Ministry of Education will embark upon an aggressive teacher retraining program through its Mabel Walker Professional Development Institute. I am proud to say With our stakeholders and our counterparts and partners, the unions, Mrs. Wilson and the Bahamas Union of Teachers, uh, the Bahamas um, Managerial Union with Mr. Woodside and the Public Services Union, particularly. We are going to craft a requirement of teachers to be re-engaged in the training and learning process every so often, Mr. Speaker. It is critical that we, in that professional institute, find ways to enable our, student, our teachers to get the upgrade in their skills and new teaching pedagogies that are so urgently required in this 21st century. Therefore, I am proud of this government for making available to the Ministry of Education some $4 million so that we can begin right now with the upgrade and refurbishment of the Mabel Walker Professional Development Institute, which will commence immediately, Mr. Speaker. That institute will be the center of professional development and ongoing capacity building for education system. <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, number two, teachers must have something to teach. That is why we are also embarking upon a foundational curriculum reform. That reform, sir, in the education system of the Bahamas is 30 years overdue. Wow. 
The curriculum today underserves our students, our society, and the job market. We must aim to develop a curriculum which are big, rigorous, relevant, and which prepare students adequately for life and work in the 21st century. We are well aware, Mr. Speaker, that preparing students for careers which do not exist as our overarching goal is to produce a 21st century graduate who is a critical thinker, a problem solver, a team player, a decision maker, who is ethical and productive and who is loyal to self, to community, and to country. Oliver Holmes once stated that a man's mind stretched by new ideas will never return to its original dimensions. Therefore, we have now developed a five-year curriculum development cycle mandated as policy, which will require, by way of data and evidence, a review every five years of our curriculum, a wholesale review. The, the, the curriculum is continuously undergoing review, Mr. Speaker. But I'm talking about a wholesale, system-wide review of the curriculum. Therefore, over the next five years, curriculum officers will undergo intense, ongoing training so that they are able to perform adequately at each phase of the cycle, which includes the collection of data or evidence, the critical assessment of the data collected, design of the curriculum, the training of teachers and administrators, so that they can implement the new curriculum. What it means, Mr. Speaker, is this. We must reorganize the curriculum so it has a scaffolding effect. From preschool, primary school builds on preschool, junior high builds on primary school, senior high builds on junior school, and so on. And not this scattered, haphazard approach to learning that we now sometimes have in our system, Mr. Speaker. <coughs> Further, sir, we have got to audit the time that it takes to teach the curriculum. And this is going to have some effect on our school day and our school year. And what happens between the hours of 9 a.m. in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon. What is the contact hour requirement in order to get through the syllabus for English in eighth grade. What is the contact? And are we meeting that? Is a very important. So the curriculum in our system is undergoing significant and uh, comprehensive change, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of time, let me move quickly. Teachers must have something to teach and they must have the tools to teach with. I want to spend a moment on this, Mr. Speaker, because this is very important. I'm going to take a drink. Technology is going to be the driver of transformation in education. Everything we do will be underpinned with innovation and efficiency of technology. Today's education educators face unique expectations compared to educators of the past, in that schools must educate students in a system where learning is accelerated by technology and its many der derivatives, the internet, social media, YouTube, WhatsApp, Facebook, FaceTime, Instagram, and so on. Today's teacher must foster academic excellence and equip students with multiple literacy that will enable them to make meaningful contributions as nation builders who are globally competitive in a digital society. We have, Mr. Speaker, 172 schools across this archipelago. There are 60 satellite offices, 50 plus thousand students, and 3,900 educational professionals. It is the intention, Mr. Speaker, that by the opening of school in 2019, the educational system of the Commonwealth of the Bahamas will be one 100% digitized. 100%. This means that every school 
an educational building will be a smart school and a smart building. Fully computerized, fully integrated, and utilizing the latest technology in all schools throughout the country to facilitate, listen to this, distance, personalized, and individual learning. This technology will also help to develop and empower the professionals and administrators to efficiently manage their environment and communicate proactively and effectively with all stakeholders, including parents, sponsors, patrons, and the wider community. Mr. Speaker, the future is now. The old paradigm of teachers standing in the front of the classroom is no more. Today, the teacher is a facilitator, a co-producer of information and knowledge. That is why I'm grateful to our government that we are embarking on a $17 million three-year technology upgrade of education, five million of which is earmarked for this budget and on July 1st, we will spend the first dollar, Mr. Minister of Finance. <laughs> so Speaker, the government of the Bahamas has a clear expectation that the education system will meet the full needs of all our students. Here's what's going to happen. In the first phase, Mr. Speaker, all of, this stu all of the buildings, all the schools will have fiber optics. That's the first phase. All of the schools. BTC and Cable Bahamas, all of them are going to, all the schools are going to have fiber optics, 100%. After that, we are going to put what is called an education management information system on top of that system. It's called EMIS on top of it. And that's going to enable the school to manage itself and the system to manage itself. We're going to be able to put in all your information, all of your personnel information, all of your grades, all of the curriculum, all of the activities, which means that parents will be able to see exactly what's going on with their child and communicate with their children's teachers. I can, with the flip of a switch on my iPhone, go into my app, pull up any school and see what's going on, which teacher is in, which teacher is out. What is now being learned and not being learned? What is the curriculum and not to it? Right here. That's the second phase. The third phase, Mr. Speaker, by the way, let me not jump ahead of myself. A part of the second phase, Mr. Speaker, is that this year, we are going to put an additional 2,500 tablets in the hands of our preschoolers and primary schools. 2,500. Which means that every preschool and preschooler will have a tablet in the Commonwealth of the Every single one. This year. This year. 2008. Every year. Moving quickly, sir. Now, Mr. Speaker, teachers have to have somebody to teach. So first of all, they have to have something to teach. They must have tools to teach with. Now they must have someone to teach. That's goal number four. So here's what, Mr. Speaker. We have decided that we are going to go youngest. We are aiming toward the universal preschool in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Universal. According to the, to the Department of Statistics, there are approximately 12,000 three to four year olds in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. 12,000. As a result of this, Mr. Speaker, we did our own investigations. And here's what we found. In the Ministry of Education in the public sector, we are only able to reach now 1,720. In the private sector, they are only able to reach between three and 4,000 preschoolers. That means, Mr. Speaker, there are approximately 7,000 three-year-olds today that do not yet have a formalized education opportunity. <coughs> Over 7,000. What does that mean when they get to grade one? They are not ready. 
If they're not ready at grade one, they're not going to be ready at grade two and beyond. What we have found, Mr. Speaker, even today, over almost 30% of our students coming to grade one are not ready. And they're going to be falling behind. Now, we are trying to do something with remediation programs. But you know, let's not wait until the toothpaste is out of the tube. Let's jump on it now. And that's what we are doing, sir. So here's what's happening. I have ordered that all across this country, wherever we can find preschool classrooms within the public sector, let's convert them right now. Because a preschool classroom, Mr. Speaker, is different than a regular classroom. See, they're little, little children. So they're, they're, the toilet has to be so, so, so low. And then the wash and so on and so forth. You have to have wash area. You have to have storage area. You have to have a lot of play things. The room has to be designed in a certain way. It has to be green. It has to be airy. So on and so forth. All right? That's number one. Number two, there are now private institutions that are also in the preschool business, and we are speaking with them now to see if they have any more capacity or if they can capacitate themselves further to enable us. And here is what we are finding, Mr. Speaker. We will be able, Mr. Speaker, that by September of this year, to add another 1,000 preschoolers to our enrollment in the public system. 1,000. And our intention is, and our intention is, sir, that every year a minimum of 1,000 students, additional students, would be added to our system such that within five years we hope to have universal preschool education in the Commonwealth of America. Now, notice what that means. We have a 100% digitized system, and we have 100% universal preschool in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Praise the living name of God, Father God. Now, we're not going to do this alone, Mr. Speaker. That is why this year, this, in February of this year, we had a conclave, followed by a conclave in April. The February conclave was just with the ministry officials and their executive team. The April conclave, we brought in over 200 of our stakeholders, including the unions, the parents, and civil society. And we said, listen, here is our plan. This is where we think we need to go in education according to our manifesto. What do you think? Here's what they told us, Mr. Speaker. 85% of the 200, 85% gave us a positive response to those plans, particularly in the area of upgrading our professionals, education professionals, the implementation of technology, upgrading our curriculum, Mr. Speaker, and the issue with pre-primary education received almost unanimous approval, 97%. When we asked our attendees what were their constraints or what they believe would be the constraints in achieving these goals? I think you know the answer, Mr. Speaker. A lack of money and human resources. And they are right. Obviously, we are going to need more money, but we will work with what we have, and we are grateful for it. And yes, we need more human beings with the specialized skills, especially at the pre-primary level. Especially, Mr. Speaker. Because if you miss that foundation, it's going to be problematic all the way through. That's why we are insisting that our best teachers are at the pre-primary. We call it pre-primary. Uh, most people know it as preschool. That's okay. It's the pre-primary level. Okay? Because they are in school. So we are on that very important part. And finally, Mr. Speaker. I went to um, the government of the Bahamas and said that the Education Act does no longer serve the legislative ambitions of this country. It is simply not responsive. We need a new act. UNESCO had offered us 
assistance in upgrading and updating our app. And we engaged them to do so. They came by in March of this year, Mr. Speaker, and uh, at a cost of $125,000, they brought a mission from Paris and elsewhere to do a complete review of our education system. They have issued their first report, which we are studying at this time. They are coming back in September of this year, Mr. Speaker, to do their final mission and produce their final report as to where they are going, what they recommend, suggest, in respect of this Education Act, which must include four very important things. And those are included in my presentation this morning. But let me give a variation to one of them, Mr. Speaker, most particularly. There's a growing circumstance in our country called home schooling, which has now come to a place to almost become an industry. Countries around the world have been grappling with this issue as to how to regulate the home schooling system and have come to this conclusion it is probably here to stay it has been decades in the making therefore mr speaker an education act in addition to what we spoke of in terms of requiring professional development in terms of recognizing the earliest years of life in terms of understanding technology and technology use and use policy and so on and so forth <coughs> must also grapple with the issue of regulation for those institutions and instances which do not now conform to the norms that we know. More and more communities and individuals are choosing the rate and pace at which they do their education. Some are not deciding that they need to wait 12 years to complete high school. Some are determining that they can do it sooner and faster, and want to be engaged in a multifarious affair, uh, um, circumstance of their education, um, appropriating unto themselves the benefit of educational instructions from around the world, whether that teaches in Pakistan, or in Israel, or in Korea. These are the things which we are now grappling with in this new educational paradigm. And as a consequence, Mr. Speaker, when I come here again to give my report in December or January of next year, December this year, January of next year, I may be able to lay on this ta the, the table of this House of Assembly the report and begin at least to circulate amongst the Bahamian people for their responses, a draft education bill 2019 or whenever it will come into being. Mr. Speaker, education is on the move. We are transforming education and, by extent, transforming the Bahamian society. I've said again and repeatedly so, education is everyone's business and everyone to get involved. God bless you and God bless the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. As many, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Golden Gates. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Good afternoon, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I rise on behalf of the wonderful residents of the great constituency of Golden Gate. It is an honor and a privilege to represent them in this honorable house of assembly, and I give th thanks to God. Mr. Speaker,
Mr. Speaker, we heard the Honorable Member uh, from South Beach just a moment ago speak about the untimely death of the security officer yesterday, Mr. Williams. And it's truly very sad where we find ourselves as a country. Have regard also to the comments made by the Honorable Member from Fox Hill just yesterday. And, Mr. Speaker, you heard numerous colleagues speak about the events of Labor Day past. It was a very sad day in the life of our country. Friday the 1st, June 2018, when at the annual Labor Day parade, four people tragically lost their lives, and many Others were seriously injured and hospitalized. Our thoughts and prayers are with them, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I am truly saddened as one of them, as she's been spoken about by several members here, Kathleen Rogers Fernanda, was someone I had known for many decades as a GHS classmate. Recently, Kathleen became president of the class of 1979, and Kathleen was committed and dedicated to keeping the group in touch with one another. In fact, just two weeks ago, she paid me a visit. As a speaker, her sister, Reverend Catherine Rogers, was a, is a well-known FNM, and indeed, the entire Rogers family of Golden Gate. Catherine is a former chairman of the Golden Gate Constituency Association for many years, and now is our chaplain. And her cousin, Levant Miller, is also a constituent of Golden Gate and the chairman of the association. I want to express my heartfelt condolences to Catherine and her entire family on the tragic, sudden, and untimely passing of Kathleen. She was a wonderful person, always positive, cheerful, and friendly. Mr. Speaker, it has been a difficult several weeks in the Golden Gates community. As another well-known FNM in the area, Sally Dill's son, Devon Francis passed away the same Friday, the very same day. Also, Harry Fernandez's brother, Mr. Fernanda Harry is a well-known FNM himself, and his brother Robert passed away on the very same Friday. These indeed have been difficult times in Golden Gates. And just weeks ago, Mr. Higgs, of a resident of Antigua Street, a longtime resident of Golden Gates, also passed away. The same week, Mrs. Joycelyn Johnson of Sisal Road, Golden Gates 1, passed away. It was about a week earlier, another well-known FNM, an executive member of the FNM, Golden Gates Association, Mr. Robert Smith's son, Robert Jr., died tragically during a home invasion. <coughs> Also, Mr. Jermaine McFall of St. John Road of Golden Gates II passed away suddenly just last week. We also lost Sheldon Taylor, a well-known FNM of many years in Golden Gates of Boyd Road, Golden Gates I. Mr. Speaker, I express my heartfelt condolences to all Golden Gates families who lost loved ones May God bless, keep, and strengthen them all during this difficult time. My prayers and thoughts are with them. May they rest in peace, and may perpetual light shine upon them. Mr. Speaker, I now discuss matters relating to BAIC. 
Before I do, Mr. Speaker, though, I want to briefly mention the statutory mandate of the corporation. We are responsible for the development of agriculture in the Bahamas. We are responsible for processing the produce of agriculture in the Bahamas. We are responsible for the marketing of produce of agriculture, of agriculture within and without the Bahamas. And we assist with the creation, development, the development of commerce and industry in the Bahamas. That is our statutory mandate as a corporation. Mr. Speaker, <coughs> Mr. Speaker, just over four months ago, consistent with our mandate, we began the BAIC Gladstone Road Farmers Market. I am happy to report that the farmers market has been nothing short of a smashing success. Thank you. 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 Thank I am pleased to inform honorable members that almost all of the produce sold at the farmer's market is still, is still, Mr. Speaker, directly from Bahamian family island farmers. In Andros, I'm just not here. Oh, I'm just Abaco, Eleuthera, Exuma, Long Island, and Cat Island. Not only are they sourced mostly from family islands, the produce is fresh, they are harvested every week, and shipped to New Providence on Thursday or Friday. And in some cases, Mr. Speaker, even Saturday morning to be at the farmer's market the same morning. Fresh. Could not be fresher. Fresh. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform you and honorable members, sir, that in spite of the corporation's dire financial position, as I have mentioned previously, we are still maintaining current payments to all of our family island farmers. Lest we forget, family island farmers were owed for several months, but now they are paid, paid timely, and they are very happy indeed. Sorry. Mr. Speaker, while it is important to ensure that our hard-working family and farmers are paid on time and on a timely basis, and we continue to do that, I am also pleased to inform you, sir, that our customers in New Providence are also very happy as perhaps the most affordable prices for fresh produce in New Providence are found at the farmer's market. It is a win-win-win situation. Absolutely. Not only for the farmers and the consumers, it has indeed also been a win for the vendors who have been at the Gladstone Road location for many years, but now are doing significantly better. Mr. Speaker, many people often say that the Bahamas hardly produces anything in the country in terms of agriculture. But I want you to know, Mr. Speaker, that is just not true. It is not true. Over the past four months, we have sold tremendous amounts of tomatoes, pumpkin, sweet potato, sweet pepper, papaya, thyme, purple and green, cabbage, strawberry, sweet um, cassava, eddy, watermelon, sabadilla, coconut, lime, celery, romaine lettuce, okra, dill, dill seed, parsley, carrot, goat pepper, eggplant, zucchini, bananas, onions, yellow and purple, Beets, green beans, squash, plantain, and all natural honey produced right here in the Bahamas, just to name a few. Those are all produced by Bahamian farmers in the Family Islands. Mr. Speaker, in fact, in fact, 
our family island farmers have produced so much tomatoes and yellow onions that the Ministry of Agriculture imposed a ban on the importation of these items. Yay. That's how much they produce. So when they say we don't produce anything, it is not true. It is not so. Yes, Renwood R. Wells, the Member of Parliament for Bamboo Town, the Honorable Member, and the Minister for Agriculture and Marine Resources, we want to thank him, especially thank him for his support of the farmer's market. And indeed, we want to thank the Ministry itself. Mr. Speaker, we are achieving at the farmer's market if I should say so. Pardon me. What we are achieving at the farmer's market, Mr. Speaker, if I should say so, cannot be understated. It cannot be. The member for Elizabeth, the Honorable Member, Dwayne Sands, Minister of Health, often emphasizes that it is critical for Bahamians to eat more healthy foods, including most importantly, fresh vegetables and fruits. Well, Mr. Speaker, we at BAIC, we are leading the way in making that a reality. And we, an, and at very affordable prices for all Bahamian families. We recognize that it is inconvenient for some persons to get to the Gladstone Road Farmers Market and that some residents of over the hill and in the city, communities in particular, do not have much affordable access to fresh fruits and vegetables. Mr. Speaker, so I'm pleased to report, if you can recall, as we promised, we have taken the pop-up farmer's market to various locations over the hill and in the city. And they include the Mother Butler Park on Meadows Street, the George Buster Brown Park on Dumping Ground Corner, and all of and both of these are in the Honorable Travis Robinson's constituency in Bain and Grantstown. Mr. Speaker, we then took the pop-up farmer's market to another area over the hill. We then took it to the Father Marshall Cooper Park, commonly referred to as Saxon's Park. On Saxon's Way, the Honorable Reese Chipman's constituency in Centerville. Mr. Speaker, we then took the, the proper farmer's market to the Cynthia Mother Pratt Park on Ponciana Avenue and 3rd Street, Coconut Grove, the Honorable Shannon Don Cartwright's constituency in St. Barnabas. Mr. Speaker, we then went to Angliston, to the Angliston Park. On Lincoln Boulevard, the Honorable Glennis Hannah Martin's constituency. <laughs> That's right. We, we, we met, we kept, and we delivered our promise, Mr. Speaker. We were going over the hill, and we're going to the inner city. Good man. Good man. We, we said back in February that we would take the pop up farmers market to those areas, and we've done just that. We have made fresh vegetables and fruits, mostly harvested the same week by our family island farmers and very affordable. But we are not stopping there either, Mr. Speaker. We also expect very soon to be in the east, then to the south, and then to the North Bahamas. At all times, Mr. Speaker, at all times, and that is every Saturday from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m., continuing our operations at the Gladstone Road, what we call home base. We started at Gladstone Road, and we have uh, operations at Gladstone Road every Saturday. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to report that in many respects, the pop-up farmer's market, which the corporation started just over four months ago, just four <coughs> months ago, has been a signature program. But a part of it has also been the processing of various fruits and vegetables. Some of the food being processed includes tamarind sauce, both brandy and regular, <laughs> guava jam, both brandy and regular, 
pepper sauces, including regular pepper sauce. We have a spicy pepper sauce. Hold on now. <laughs> and, and what we call, Mr. Speaker, wildfire. Well, wildfire is very, very hot. Some like it that way, Mr. Speaker. Also, watermelon juice. All of these items and more are made by BAIC and are available at our farmer's market. Mr. Speaker, I want to say a special thank you to the wonderful staff at BAIC who have made our success at the farmer's market a reality. It was only three Saturdays ago, Mr. Speaker, that the staff left their homes early in the morning in the rain to be at the market before 8 a.m. to open. Moreover, it rained the entire day. In fact, we wrote and presented a letter of commendation to each person who worked the farmer's market on that day. And with your leave, Mr. Speaker, I would like to read that letter into the record of the House of Assembly. Quote, on behalf of the Bahamas Agricultural and Industrial Corporation, BAIC, I would like to congratulate you for a job well done at the Pop-Up Farmers Market at Gladstone Road on Saturday 26, May 2018, where you worked while it was stormy. Your invaluable efforts and unselfish willingness to give up your personal time in such inclement weather has not gone unnoticed. Once again, thank you for your contribution, and we look forward to your continued success, assistance. Close quote. That was a letter that was given and presented to each staff member who worked that Saturday, May 26, when it was stormy, and not a person left, Mr. Speaker. We talk often about people in the civil service and, and people working for government and what they're not prepared to do or willing to do. Um, they all were there at the appointed time. They remained there and worked. Um, wonderfully, the best attitude one can have in doing customer service. They did it, and we were happy to recognize that and present them with a letter. And each, each person had a, that same letter given to them, addressed to them, and those letters have gone on their files, Mr. Speaker, their personal files. So we thank them again. Mr. Speaker, I would be remiss if I did not also express my gratitude to the hundreds hundreds of customers of the farmer's market who brave the same inclement weather. They came out and they supported our farmer's market. I would also like to thank the many thousands of customers over the four months who have supported us since the inception of the program. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the finances of BAIC. The corporation's finances, financial situation, has slightly improved, Mr. Speaker, but it is still, still in dire financial straits. Since my mid-year budget contribution earlier this year, we have continued to discover reckless and irresponsible spending of the worst kind by the former government. We continue to discover fiscal abuses and a gross lack of accountability and transparency by the former government, which have put BIC in dire financial straits. For example, Mr. Speaker, during the last administration, while the amount involved is not significant, it's not significant, it speaks to the way they govern. A person was asked to remove tires from BAIC property at the main headquarters. He was given a BAIC check as an installment or mobilization, but did not remove one, not a single tire from the BAIC property, not one. In spite of this, Mr. Speaker, if you can believe this, the same person was given a second BAIC check. Again after receiving the second check and knowing full well that he received the first one and did absolutely nothing for it, still 
No ties were removed. Incredibly, Mr. Speaker, less than a month before the general election, in April last year, the same person was given a third BIC check. And from that day to this day, he has still not removed a single tire from BAIC's property. In total, the person was paid, as I said in the beginning, it's not a large amount, 6900 Compared to the other amounts we talked about last time? <laughs> exactly. By three BIC checks. Mr. Speaker, this is not right. He did absolutely nothing to earn the 6900 And they pretend that they do not understand why we have increased taxes? <laughs> my friend, my friend, the honorable member for Cat Island, Rumkey, and San Salvador, some time ago, mentioned in a similar circumstance, similar to what I just mentioned, that the real question, the real question, the real question, the real question that the government is whether the government, quote, according to the, to the honorable member, quote, got value for money, close quote. And I can understand. I understand the point. I wonder what he would say about this. Hmm. Clearly, there was no, and I mean no value for money in this case. In reality, BAIC's money was just plainly speaking, given away. Given away, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, with your leave, I'd like to lay on the table some photos showing the same tires just as and where they were on BIC's property for more than a year. But as we said, an another $6,900 of the people's money just went down the drain, literally. Mr. Speaker, as you can see, as you can see, Mr. Speaker, these are your tires. There are four containers, and they're all filled with tires. All these are tires, all those are tires. And the tires are all along the street. Tires all in the property have been there so long that the green growth is over some of the tires over here. And the same thing here. Tires all in the back. Tires all the way in the back. Tires everywhere. These are the tires that BAIC paid $6,900 to have removed, and not one tire was removed. And that's how the tires are today. You go there today, you'll meet the tires there. You go today, the tires are still there in the same condition. These folks were just taken last week. The same, the same condition. Put them in front. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in addition to the obvious concern for the lack of value for money and what appears to be money simply paid out of the coffers of BIC, there are a lot of environmental concerns from standing water and the implications of a fertile area for mosquitoes, rodents, and vectors while another rainy season is upon us. Naturally, this is a serious health hazard and major concern of the Honorable Member for Elizabeth, Honorable Dwayne Sands, the Minister of Health, and the Ministry of Health. Mr. Speaker, in addition to the tire situation, there was the issue of the cost of trucking, particularly from the feed mill to Porter's Key Dock, and sometimes Iowa Key, but mostly Porter's Key Dock, for shipping feed to the family island, the livestock farmers. There's evidence 
that some truckers were paid as low as $175 or $181, while others were paid twice as much, Mrs. Speaker. We have two providers, truckers, 175 and 181. Yet still we have others who are paid twice as much for the same work, driving the same distance, taking the same fee from the same point A to the same B. Yet still, they paid twice as much, Mr. Speaker. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there was no value for money. In fact, it would be most difficult to justify the more than double billing and the pay thereof. They were paid, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the former government published, pardon me, purchased the same feed mill, purchased an automa automation machine for about $100,000 in 2015. And to date, that same machine has not been used. And indeed, it was never even assembled. Wow. It sits there. Wow. You go to feed mill right now today on Gladstone Road. They'll show you the parts in the box. The people's money. Today, as we said, many of the parts are in boxes. But that's not all, Mr. Speaker. A building which has been referred to as, quote, unquote, an electrical room was also built for about $40,000. But like the machine, it was never used. It sits there. People's money wasted. It's the people's money. Worse than all of that. The former government engaged a consultant for the training on the machine who was ready, willing, and able, it seems, to perform the training on the machine. I will not say more than that, Mr. Speaker, as the matter resulted, as others have, in litigation. The matter is in litigation. Mr. Speaker, BAIC is very grateful for the assistance it has received from the Prime Minister, the Honorable Hubert A. Minnis, and the Member for Kalani, the Minister of Finance and Deputy Prime Minister, the Honorable K. Peter Tanquess, the Honorable Member for East Grand Bahama, and quite naturally, our very own Minister, Renwood R. Wells, the Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Marine Resources, and responsibility for BAIC. We thank them very much for the assistance that we have received since the mid-year budget. Mr. Speaker, we are pleased to announce that given the financial assistance since the mid-year budget debate, we have been able to recommence, Mr. Speaker, we have been able to recommence our employee group medical plan. For months, we had none. It had been in suspension, to be precise. It had been in suspension. But we are fortunate we have recommenced it due to the assistance we received. Mr. Speaker, we also note, importantly, that all employees who made out-of-pocket payments when the medical group plan was suspended have now, be, have now been reimbursed. So anyone, while the program was suspended, they had to go pay directly from their pockets. BIC has now repaid them. Mr. Speaker, we are also pleased to announce that BIC staff who have been awarded increments, and the uh, Honorable Member for South Beach, we're just talking about increments in the Ministry of Education that have been due for years, but not given. But we are also pleased to announce that BIC staff who have been awarded increments in their pay for months have now been paid along with any and all back pay that was due them. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to inform you and honorable members that after about 18 months of challenges relevant to the plumbing at the Produce Exchange at Porter's Key Dock, we have now corrected them all. And as a direct result, the exchange is now open to serve the public from 7 a.m. to 3 p.m. Monday to Friday. and still open 7 a.m. to noon on Saturdays. I am also pleased to report that there were also challenges 
with the air conditioning at the Pros Exchange. But that, those issues too have been corrected. And I can assure you that the place is very cool now, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, we also plead to inform you that unlike previous years under the former government, we have paid the funds we collected from the employees to NIB yeah. every month. From January 2018 to May 2018, we've paid NIB the monies we collected from the employees every month. Unlike the prior government, we, as a corporation, have not taken the employees' contribution and not paid them the NIB. They didn't do that. In fact, many have asked, what happened to the money? Right. We hope to find out soon, Mr. Speaker. Wow. While still facing financial challenges, we have been paying the portion deducted from the employees' salaries. However, however, the corporation's portion is still outstanding, including the $1 million we mentioned at the mid-year budget debate, as indicated then, and the amounts to date. Mr. Speaker, you might recall that during my budget, mid-year budget contribution, I revealed to the House of Assembly and honorable members that no audited financial statements which are required by the law creating BIC were completed during the prior five years. Wow. I reveal that at the mid-year budget debate. A little million dollars gone. We'll soon find out. Mm. Since then, the Honorable Minister for Agriculture and Marine Resources, Aaron R. Wells, tabled both the 20 and 12 audited financial statements in this Honorable House. The audited financial statement for the year 2014 is actively being worked on and, once completed, will also be tabled. Then we will move to the remaining years, 2015, 2016, 2017. You see, Mr. Speaker, we are not, we are not like the side opposite. We are indeed different, Mr. Speaker, and we govern differently. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, with regard to the solar system, the much talked about solar system uh, that I talked about during my mid-year budget contribution, once we are in a better financial position, we will have the existing solar system reviewed to determine what options are available to the corporation. Mr. Speaker, since the mid-year budget debate, management and the board of directors decided to restructure the corporation and its departments. Bear in mind, Mr. Speaker, that while we spoke a lot about line staff during the mid-year budget debate, it might have been lost on some that there was also a serious need to restructure the corporation at the management level. There were, Mr. Speaker, 15 persons in senior management or higher posts at the corporation with fewer than 200 staff. Therefore, hard, tough, and difficult decisions had to be made for the good of the corporation and the country. Mr. Speaker, the corporation's management and the board of directors are facing very challenging, difficult circumstances. Prior to the restructuring of BAIC, there were 12 departments, 12. Now, due to the restructuring, there are only five. Three of the five are operational departments, and two are administrative. The three operational departments are the Entrepreneurial Planning and Development Department, the Property and Land Management Department, and finally, the Agri-Business Development Department. Mr. Speaker, with reference to our leased properties and space at our Soldier Road Industrial Park, where many tenants for decades, for decades, Mr. Speaker, owed hundreds of thousands of dollars to BIC, and at least one owed in excess of $1 million. As we said during the budget debate, I am pleased to report that all, all five, have now left the park. 
None of them are there. They're all gone. No, sir. We are looking at leasing those properties in the near future as there has been very significant interest expressed. The board of directors has determined that BAIC is to seek the least funds that are outstanding. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I should now move to the issue that has been the main matter of concern for the public regarding the budget. That is, of course, the matter of value-added tax, or VAT. Mr. Speaker, from early on, and for some time, I have been a strong proponent of removing VAT from breadbasket items, as it, as it was a certain promise we made to the Bahamian people during the, during the general election year. Mr. Speaker, now we are doing just that. I am very pleased that we are delivering on that promise, which is so important to so many people. Mr. Speaker, I applaud the Honorable Prime Minister, the Honorable Minister of Finance, and the Cabinet for fulfilling in this budget a solemn promise made to the Bahamian people. I applaud the government of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, corned beef <laughs> has taken some chafing. <laughs> Good old corned beef. But so far, Minister Health, it has made the list. <laughs> it's a survival list. <laughs> yes, 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 well, so far, right? I am pleased that the Minister of Finance also said that tuna has been added to the list, Mr. Speaker. As tuna and yellow grits is my favorite breakfast. <laughs> exactly. Sardines and mackerel, as noted by the Minister of Finance, has also been added to the list. Mm -hmm. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this FNM government has also delivered on the promise of removing VAT from medicines, uh. which includes, importantly, over-the-counter medications. Yeah. For example, cough syrup, painkillers, etc., yeah. yeah. which will affect a tremendous amount of people, if not all of us, all of us, in this chamber and elsewhere, at some time, at some time. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this f and government has not only provided VAT relief from electricity bills of $100 per month, which affects some 30,000 people, but that the Minister of Finance shared with this House just last week a decision by this government to increase that amount the $200 per month for residential customers, which will affect some 63,000 persons or residential customers. They will not have to pay VAT, Mr. Speaker. If their bill is $200 or less, there'll be no VAT on the electricity bill. That's 63,000 homeowners. Another promise kept and delivered by this f and government. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this f and government kept and delivered its promise, not only to remove VAT from electricity, but also water bills, if they are less than $50 per month, which will affect some 43,000 residential customers. That's 43,000, Mrs. Speaker, will be positively affected. affected. No VAT, because they have $50 or less a month. Mrs. Speaker, I am also pleased to note that this administration has made a decision to increase the customs duty exemption to $500 twice a year per person. The Honorable Member from West Grand Baham and Bimini yesterday evening did a wonderful job with her, uh, with her piece she prepared making this point. Yeah. And um, we are very pleased about that. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, during the general election last year, we committed to improving improving the conditions and the way of life over the hill. And we are doing that too in this budget. This very budget, we are doing that. It was a firm, it was a certain promise, and we are delivering on it, Mrs. Speaker. People's budget. In this budget, through the committed five and a half million dollars for entrepreneurial development, this government is bringing real ownership to the people and not just jobs yes. to over the hill. 
Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to hear that the government is taking the need for housing in this country very seriously. As we all know, the list of persons seeking homes and property for homes, it's a, it's a long list. It's been a long list for some time. But this government has committed to providing 300 service lots for less than $30,000 per lot. This will help people who are eagerly awaiting that dream of a home, Mr. Speaker. When these same lots are expected to have an appraised value at the time of purchase of about 40000 to 70000 in equity, starting out from Jump Street, Mr. Speaker, essentially, persons who obtain these lots will have the equity in them greater than their cost, Mr. Speaker. The equity will be greater than the cost. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this government is actively helping young families and others who are first-time homeowners by extending the crucial and critical stamp tax exemption. Those of us who practice now or previously practiced law in this area in real, real property, we know how critical it is and how the stamp, the stamp duty is so prohibitive in owning and acquiring property. So we're very pleased that the government has decided to extend the stamp tax exemption for five years. The one asset that most families have in their, is their home. So we thank the government for making home ownership possible. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased that this FNM government is taking skills acquisition to a new level, especially in the vocational and technical areas where a lot of young men and women are deficient by offering scholarships to the tune of 2.6 million in this budget year alone. And it was spoken to already by the Honorable Minister for Education, Mr. Jeffrey Lloyd, just said a moment ago, what the government is doing at BDVI. It's a wonderful thing. We say all the time, there's not enough opportunities for our young men in particular. And this government is stepping up to the plate and is delivering 2.6 million in scholarships. So if you want to go, you can go. Mr. Speaker, having regard to the many areas this government is providing relief and care, relief and care to the Bayman people, it is my fervent hope that it would seriously consider a short-term relief for families in the terms of back to school. And I saw in the paper the, the, the Honorable um, Minister of Finance had some comments. But it is my fervent hope that we do consider a short-term relief for families in terms of back to school, I recommend that the government consider a VAT free back to school supplies period of the 1st of July 2018 to the 30th of September 2018. Mrs. Mr. Speaker, I am, I am pleased. I, yeah, I am pleased that this FNM government will employ. Mr. Speaker? Mr. Speaker? I thought you called it a week. Wait, wait, wait a moment. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, um, you know, Mr. Speaker, uh, there's been a lot of murmuring on, on past, more than murmuring. But you know, the reality is, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, there are most members in this room, in this chamber, in some measure, will do their best to assist constituents and some sort of back to school. I think most members do their best in that regard. But we're also aware that we are limited in what we can do, and we are aware of the pressing need. And we're also aware that there are some students who may go to school the first week into September and may discover what's really needed. And so that is why um, we've uh, put the date to September 30th. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I got one least. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I am pleased that this FNM government will employ strategies. And I'm going to repeat this, Mr. Speaker. I am pleased that this FNM government will employ strategies to increase real property tax compliance <laughs> across all, all brackets, Mr. Speaker, all brackets, as there are likely substantial opportunities for revenue generation there, and those taxes are less regressive. They are less regressive. And across all brackets, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I'm also pleased <coughs> that this African government has decided to increase the real property tax on foreign-owned vacant land to 2% from 1.5%. In fact, 
Mr. Speaker, it is my view that non Bahamians who are holding vacant land ought to pay at least 3% per annum. Mr. Speaker, I now move to the issue of the VAT increase itself. We appreciate the view and concern, Mr. Speaker, held by some regarding the effect of the increase on the vulnerable and the economically challenged persons in particular in our community. There is little doubt, however, Mr. Speaker, that the main reason for this is the reckless and irresponsible spending by the former PLB government, as we have seen at BAIC and other corporations, authorities, departments, and ministries of the government. Mr. Speaker, the government was left with no other real or reasonable alternative but to make this increase in an effort to save our country from fiscal disaster down the road. However, I would like to recommend that the government in three years, presumably achieving a balanced budget, give serious consideration to reducing the VAT. Having regard to the fiscal realities, the irresponsible PLP government left behind, it would have been a dereliction of duty on the part of this government if it did not make the tough and, yes, hard decision to increase the VAT by 4.5%. It would have been a dereliction of duty in regard to where we find ourselves financially in this country today. Mr. Speaker, we need to be honest and abundantly clear with ourselves and the Bahamian people as to what we are facing in this country today regarding our true fiscal situation. The fact of the matter is that the PLP government overspent its 2016-2017 budget, <coughs> its budget now, the amount they said they would, by an unprecedented amount of, and I want the public to listen to this, $661 million. $661 million overspent. So tell me, what are we, the FNM, left to do? We as a government, what are we left to do? In reality, the PLP was not able to go to the public before an election to seek the 15% increase in VAT, as they discussed it before the general election of May 10, 2017. What a duplicitous group. So what did they do? They spent the money anyway. They spent the money. $661 million, unprecedented in the history of the Bahamas. What a crying shame. Right. Mr. Speaker, this f &M government is really forced, and yes, I said forced, to ask the Bahamian people to pay for, to pay for the PLP's VAT increase. That was never sought, never debated in Parliament or approved. That is the real and true massive, quote, massive betrayal. It is truly beyond imagination and belief what the PLP did to our country and its finances during their last five years in office, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, today, the decision to support this budget is not an easy one, but it is one for the future of our dear and beloved country and for generations unborn. Mr. Speaker, again, it's truly been a pleasure and an honor and a privilege to represent the Golden Gates constituency over the past 12 months. We plan to have a Hurricane Preparedness Town Hall meeting on Monday, the 25th of June at 7 p.m. We also note that we have intensified our tree trimming <coughs> efforts in the area. That will be followed by our beautification and backyard farming competition. Further, we are in the process of planning a summer camp, Mr. Speaker, and of course, as I mentioned earlier, our back-to-school activities, which uh, perhaps will be even more important this year than previous years, we are pleased that our monthly meetings have been held the second Tuesday of the month at Civil Strong Primary School, Carmichael Road. We thank our many residents who have supported our events and activities over the past year, and residents may contact the office at 361-4363. And again, Mr. Speaker, Golden Gates supports the budget. Thank you, Mr. Speaker.
Thank you. As many? The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Fort Charlotte. The Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Bamboo Town. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are going to spend at this point in time and take our lunch break. I see the member for Fort Charlotte is in the shoot and ready to go. I see he has his executive team from Basra. So at 3 p.m. today, we will, we will begin this process again in earnest. So we're going to, um, I do move that the House to suspend until 3 p.m. today. Second. It, it has been moved and seconded that the business of this House do suspend until 3 p.m. this afternoon. As many as are in favor will remain seated. Those who oppose will stand. The business of this House stands suspended until 3 p.m. this afternoon.